Awesome. Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the seventh edition of our BizNow Florida webinar series, The Future of the Hospitality Industry. This is a weekly series here in Florida and throughout the U.S., Canada, and United Kingdom. My name is Joe Bianco, a business manager with BizNow, and I'm thrilled to welcome you into my house, along with over 700 people who have signed up for today's webinar. Each week, we'll hear directly from the leaders in the commercial real estate industry. We will learn how they're running their companies during the coronavirus, the decisions that they're making during these uncertain times, and learn their insight on the market. Here at BizNow, our sole goal is to continue to push the commercial real estate industry forward by advancing, connecting, and informing the community to do more business. I wanna thank all of you at home for joining us today. You will all be a part of that story as we utilize the BizNow webinar series to keep the vital wheels of our industry turning. You can and should sponsor these webinars. It's the best way to reach those in the industry at this time. Feel free to reach out to me at joe.bianco at biznow.com. Before I introduce our speakers, a few quick housekeeping notes. To all of our attendees, if you're not presenting today, you're on mute and without video. So don't worry about fixing your hair if the dog barks in the background. This is a video platform and a lot of us are dialed in from home. And if you experience a slight delay or any technical difficulties, please log out and log back in. Now, look to the right of your screen. This is the chance to interact with me and the other panelists. You'll see a Q&A section, as well as a section to ask the panelists questions. Now, we'll try and get through as many of these as possible, and only questions asked in the Q&A section will be answered and related to the panelists. And lastly, don't worry. The recordings of these webinars will be emailed to you after this session and will be available on the Big Marker platform in case you missed any information. Without further ado, I'd like to introduce our moderator, Jeff Harden, founder, owner, and CEO of Stratacon Construction. Thanks, Joe. And, Jeff, and uh, I'd like to start out and take a moment to thank all. Can you hear me okay, guys? All right. Thanks, Joe. I want to start out and take a moment to thank our essential workers who've been on the front lines of this COVID pandemic. We appreciate their efforts in keeping us all safe. Secondly, I want to thank BizNow for organizing this event. We appreciate this forum as a vehicle to discuss the vital role that hospitality plays in South Florida. I'm, my name is Jeff Harden. I'm the CEO and founder of Stratacon Construction. We're based here in South Florida and have been in business for nearly 30 years. We are currently building seven hospitality projects in South Florida, two of which I'll quickly highlight. We're building the, Boca, uh, the Mandarin Oriental in Boca Raton. It's just coming out of the ground. We've poured our first elevated slab, and thankfully the project is moving forward with only minor delays. Also, we're working on a large hospitality project on the redevelopment of Walker's Cay in the Bahamas. We are just finalizing the marina construction it will begin upland and modular work starting in the next quarter. But enough about Stratacon. I would like to pass it along to our panelists, Carlos Rodriguez Sr. with Driftwood, Richard Millard with Trust Hospitality, and Keith Menon with Menon Hospitality to kick off our discussion on the future of hospitality in South Florida. Carlos, could you please start us off with a self-introduction? Sure. Um... First of all, welcome everybody. Thank you for joining us in the webinar. Uh, we at Driftwood is, you know, as a family of companies under the Driftwood umbrella, uh, Driftwood Capital. For one, we have um, four funds. Uh, one is uh, we're launching a new fund for MES lending and preferred equity that we'll be launching in the next month or so. Uh, we have a, uh, a fund for acquisitions of existing hotels uh, that we just finished raising and has a lot of capital ready to deploy in acquisitions throughout the United States. Uh, we also have a fund, uh, Driftwood Development uh, Fund, uh, for development of new hotels inside the United States, where we're looking to develop several hotels. Actually, we already have several in the pipeline that we're looking and working on developing. Uh, among them, a Westin, a $250 million Westin in, in Cocoa Beach, and, and a couple of canopy hotels that we're building, and, and several other deals that we have in the, in the pipeline. And then we have the original fund, Driftwood Acquisitions and Development, along with the uh, sister company, uh, Driftwood Hospitality Management, 
that manages hotels across the country for uh, us and also for third party investors. Thanks, Carlos. Uh, Richard, could you uh, introduce yourself? Sure, good afternoon, everybody. Thanks for being here. Um, strange time. Um, I've been in the hotel business longer than anybody on this call because I'm the oldest. I've done this for 55 years. This is certainly a first for me, so I'm sure it's a first for everybody else. We've been in business, my company, for the last 32 years. We're based in Coral Gables, Florida. We have hotels from New York to Brazil. Um, it's interesting for us because between now and the end of the year, we're supposed to open five new construction hotels. Um, we're trying to figure out whether we should open and when we should open, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, I'm gonna be interested to hear what questions people have in this discussion. I know Carlos and uh, Keith very well, have a lot of respect for both of them. So I'll be very interested to hear what we all have to say today. But uh, thanks for joining us. All right, thanks, Richard. How about you, Keith? How are you guys? Uh, this is, I think, my third time speaking on Biz Now, twice at Richard, which I adore doing this with. I want to welcome everybody today. Uh, I'm the founder and principal of Menon Hospitality, and we manage hotels, restaurants, and bars, mainly in South Florida. Uh, and we're actually building one of the most exciting buildings I'm doing with my family called Nativo, which is located downtown Miami, right behind the Flagler building. And it's a 570 story building with 600 units of residential, with home sharing, hotel, and about 70,000 square feet of amenities. So um, we are also uh, been looking at our, our building and finding better ways to, to kind of adapt to the next 2.0 way of hospitality and also living. Uh, so we are excited to be here today and, and speak with this panel and answer any questions everybody has. Awesome, thanks so much, Keith, for joining us today. Uh, first question for the panelists, uh, could you tell the audience a little bit about how your business has been affected by the COVID-19 pandemic? Uh, maybe start with you again, Carlos, if that's okay. Sure. Um, well, our existing portfolio was definitely affected. We, uh, you know, had to unfortunately uh, temporarily lay, lay off, uh, you know, uh, over 3,000 workers, uh, team members. And we're hoping to have them rejoin us as soon as possible. Uh, so the existing portfolio was definitely affected, just like everybody else. Um, the good news is uh, we're starting to see some signs of revival in some of the hotels, especially in the uh, resorts and the leisure markets. Um, but, uh, you know, it. it I guess for us, the good part was that it caught us in a moment in time where we're very liquid and that we can basically inject the capital needed to sustain the hotels. Um, and, you know, so our hotels are, are going to survive this, this, uh, this mess uh, and we're going to live to fight another day. But we have the same headaches that all the hoteliers across the country are having and across the world are having. Um, on the new fund side, it actually caught us in a very good moment because basically we just finished launching and are in the process of launching a third fund. And now we have a lot of money to be able to come in as white knights and assist people in trouble, inject capital as preferred share, as preferred equity or inject or do mess lending or, or help in joint ventures to those that are struggling and that need capital assistance. So it caught us in a good moment in time where we can be of assistance uh, from that end, but we still have the same headaches that everybody's having, uh, where we have to go down to skeleton crews, um, close a couple of, you know, of the hotels down and, uh, and work with the lenders, uh, to resolve the issues of all the hotels. So, you know, we're not exempt from that. I think everybody in the world is going through the same process and, you know, having to deal with those issues. Uh, the good news was that it caught us in a moment in time where we have the strength in the balance sheet to be able to, to survive it and sustain it. Okay, thank you. Richard? A total disaster for us, a total and complete disaster for lots of reasons. First of all, we were completely unprepared. I'm not sure how prepared anybody else was, but we were completely unprepared. I mean, the fact that maybe 10 days before we shut everything down, we were, we had no clue that this was gonna happen. 
Uh, we closed every hotel we have but two. One is by a hospital in New York and one is by the airport in Miami. Otherwise, everything, was, everything has been shut down. I think, um, I mean, what's happened to date, we're all surviving. Um, I don't think that's the issue, but I think we got maybe another 30 days of survival, then I'm not sure what happens to everybody. Um, this reopening, if and when it happens, and we'll talk about that, I'm sure. Right now, we really don't know. In Miami, apparently, we're gonna open up restaurants and other things next week, but not hotels. There's all kinds of thoughts about it. So it's a complete disaster. I, I, you know, I can't say that it is, and I don't see most of us that operate hotels, certainly as a pure operator, um, receiving any income for the remainder of this year of any kind. So for us, a complete disaster. I hate to be the bearer of bad news, but I, I think that's what it is. That's what it's been for us. And uh, we obviously laid off everybody, and we also laid off everybody of our corporate staff as well. Um, it's, it's an interesting phenomenon because you find out a lot about the people that you work with. Most of our team in our corporate office has been here for a long time. And they are all working full time from home, making plans as to how we reopen our hotels. So you learn a lot about it. It's been an interesting experience. The one thing that has gone away from my life is stress. There's nothing to stress about because we have we have no customers. So um, for us, it's been a disaster. Okay, uh, Keith, uh, comment on this: how it's impacted your business. Sure. So as Richard first mentioned, this is something that nobody saw coming. Uh, nobody could plan for it. And it was very shocking. Um, with us at Men in Hospitality, our first thought was always, how do we help and deal with our employees? Uh, it was very hard to have hundreds of employees that are furloughed and some let go and our corporate level employees. So our first thing was, how do we handle our employees first? And we're going to be okay and figure out our business after. Um, with that said, uh, we have businesses like Bodega Fort Lauderdale that we're building now, which is a very exciting expansion to the Las Olas and Riverfront Market. So something like that, uh, we decided to keep building through this coronavirus and hopefully when it ends and we're back to a somewhat new normality, we'll open very strong and very exciting for the community and kind of get excited back again. Um, on our bigger projects like Nativo in downtown Miami, um, you know, we had to close our sales center. And we had to really gear all of our 12 salespeople to going viral and selling in a new era. So the good news there was that we were well over 50% sold before this crisis. And believe it or not, we've been selling tremendously well through it. So um, we just had to think ourselves differently. And, and it was hard to tell salespeople, you have to work from home. We had to quickly get the tools to sell. We had to you know, really manage that and rethink our amenity space. So that was a good thing was we still had a time to rethink health and wellness. So now we're thinking through how to build a building smarter, knowing what we just went through and what people want to demand and what they want to see when we're out of this disaster, as Richard said. Uh, so we've thought of things with amenities, with open spaces. Um, we are also selling beautiful office condos with one Sotheby's. And we thought about what do people want then? Maybe there's smaller conference rooms. Maybe there's, you know, less less spaces for big gatherings so it gave us a chance to really rethink that project but overall it's been very very challenging and you know really my heart goes out to the world and everybody in this industry there's there's no one in this industry who's doing well or who's happy as far as business so i think the key is we've done very well staying together and being unified um i think that that's really the key to the hospitality industry thanks so much keith uh the next question for our panelists and I guess we'll start with Carlos again. In your opinion, how is COVID-19 different from other economic or viral outbreaks, such as the Great Recession or Zika that affected us a couple of years ago? I mean, this is a worldwide thing. I mean, I've never seen something affect us in the entire world, in, in all the industries at the same time. I mean, when you think about it, I mean, this is 9-11 this is and 2008 all put together, all combined. Um, I mean, the world came to a standstill. So while, I mean, as, as uh, Richard alluded to earlier, we've all, I mean, I've, I've been in the hotel business 35 years now, and uh, not as much as Richard, <laughs> but, but I've been in it for 35 years. And, uh, 
you know, I've been through black swan events like, like, like 9-11, but this is different. Uh, this is definitely different. And, um, you know, in this particular case, I think one of the main factors is, I mean, the economy was going strong. It was going well until this happened. So the question is really, when will the vaccine, the proper vaccine come through or where will the proper testing be done? Because that's key to get us out of this. Testing, vaccines, medications is the key really to get us out of this. Um, there's not much more we can do until that happens to really reopen the economy and everybody to feel comfortable uh, going to business as usual. So, um, I mean, it's gonna be a prolonged uh, ramp up. I mean, it's gonna be a slow ramp up and I think that that's gonna be a little bit different from others. Um, but, you know, this too shall pass. And uh, as long as you can survive, um, you know, the next few months, uh, you know, this too shall pass and it'll be, you know, I, I have a lot of uh, optimism for the long-term uh, perspective of the industry in general. I mean, we're very resilient. And as Keith was saying, as long as we all pull together and we work as an industry together, I mean, I believe very strongly in the industry in general. So this too shall pass and in a few months we should be fine. But it's going to be a slow ramp up, guys. It's not going to be a quick, uh, you know, V-shaped, uh, you know, recovery. I think it's going to be more of a very long U. Great response. Uh, Richard, thoughts on this and the difference between Great Recession and Zika from before? Yeah, I think, I think um, Carlos said the most important thing. It's a worldwide issue, so it just, it's not just about us. I think, um, I think our focus in general has been a knee-jerk focus and reaction to it, even in our business. I think all of the public um, comments made by our leaders are, have not been great in this situation. I think our short-term knee-jerk reaction that the world will never be the same has had a horrible reaction from the public, and I don't believe it's true. I believe, the, I believe the next two years are gonna be a nightmare. But I think after that, we are, we're not, not going to go to restaurants anymore. We're not gonna wear masks and gloves and go to a restaurant and have it be 30% full. First of all, economically, it makes no sense. You can't do it. We're not, not going to go football games anymore. We're not, not gonna stay in hotels anymore. We're not gonna have plastic signs up everywhere for the rest of our lives, maybe for the short term but there's been no real focus on a short-term and a long-term plan here. So it's very, really different. And most of the focus, focus from the economy um, basis is just on the short-term reaction to what we're gonna do. And I think it's gotta be a better long-term reaction. We've never seen that before. Nobody's really dealt, we're not, we haven't really dealt with the issue. We're just trying to like adapt our lives to the issue for the time being. And I, I, I just don't think it's real life. I think culturally we're gonna go back to the way we were. The question is when. So it's very different from what's happened in the past and nothing's ever shut down the entire world, certainly not in the last couple of centuries anyway, like it has. The depression was nothing like this. The depression did not have to do with a worldwide virus. So it's very, very different. Um, and that's why we're all so lost because it is so different. So, um, I mean, there's, it, this has no relationship to anything that I've ever seen ever before. Most of the things that I've been wars, or um, terrorism or you know, financial difficulties, but a worldwide pandemic in this century is bizarre. So very different. Thank you. Keith? You know, uh, I, I, I agree with what Carlos was saying. I think you know, this is something no one's ever seen before. Um, you know, this is the whole world getting sick. This, is, this has been in a crazy global spread and I think you know, our world leaders have done great trying to keep us informed and give aid to our industry and help companies financially and help employees. So I think, you know, we just all have to stick together and ride this condo together and hopefully it'll get easier. And yes, you know, there will be a called semi weird period, right? In this interim with the mask and the gloves and things of that nature. But, you know, we have to listen, do the best we can and hopefully try to get back to somewhat of a normality. Uh, in the near future. So, you know, we are literally just watching every day, learning every day, and, uh, you know, hopefully everyone's just staying safe 
and trying to get through this all together. Thank you. Uh, I have a couple of questions uh, from our attendees and, and I think we will try and answer live here and let's see what happens. Uh, anonymous attendee, have any of your organizations applied for relief through the PPP program? Um, Carlos? Sure. Yes. Um, we've applied, you know, for all of our hotels and we've obtained the PPP program, I think is an excellent program. Um, you know, because basically it, it, it helps the hotels and it helps uh, the, the staff, it helps us be able to rehire staff uh, sooner rather than later. So um, number one, I think it's an excellent program. Number two, uh, it was handled in a very timely manner. So I applaud, frankly, the government for having come up with this program and for the speed with which they reacted. And quite frankly, also for increasing the funding because you know the first one, they ran out of funds and then they, and then they issued a, a second batch. So, so um, yes, we have applied and uh, I'm a big, big proponent of it. And I actually congratulate uh, the government and all the government officials for what they did because it definitely helps us weather the storm a little bit better and it helps us rehire and bring uh, staff back to the hotels. Thanks. Uh, how about you, uh, Richard? Yeah, we applied right away. Um, we got our money right away. I think administratively they did an amazing job. I don't know how they pulled it off, but the Monday morning that the funds were available, they were in our bank account. That's how fast it happened. So. We, we applied right away. They did a great job. We actually, one of the interesting things that we did do was that we bank with a rather large bank and our outside accountant said, hey, you're probably not their biggest client. You may not get on the top of the list. Go to a small bank. And we did. We went to a bank we had not done business with before, a small bank in Carl Gables. And we opened up a small account with them and they did the application for us and they did a great job. So it was an interesting piece of advice that we got rather than being part of a big crowd in a big bank, we went to a smaller bank and they focused on us and they got it done. So uh, yeah, it's a great program. And it was administered, administered incredibly well, we thought, for us. Thank you. Keith? Likewise, it, uh, it was beyond helpful, beyond fast. I was actually shocked at how this thing went so fast and the government did phenomenal. And uh, it was really an amazing tool and I also didn't expect it to be this quick, this somewhat perfect, and this instrumental, but I will say that a lot of our businesses and hotels, this was a vital thing. So I, could, I can't thank the government enough and the funny enough, it was just great. Yeah, we, Stratacon, we also benefited from the program and we're very happy with uh, the way it was administered and very helpful to, to us continuing our operations. Uh, another question we, we have from our audience, uh, do, you, do you panelists see any changes, modifications with your design team, architects, interior designers to adjust to the new realities with your facilities, uh, health, wellness, safety, security? Uh, Carlos? Yes, actually, it's funny enough, I, we just, I mentioned the project, uh, the Western project in Cocoa Beach that we're in the process of designing right now. And I was just uh, our architects as, uh, the, uh, from the team from Gensler. And we're talking specifically about having a meeting uh, early next week just to discuss uh, changes to the design as a result of, of the pandemic uh, and having spaces that can be easily adaptable uh, to modifications uh, in the future to, to allow for this type of flexibility. So yes, we are looking into it uh, as we speak uh, for all the developments. So that's just one, one example. But we are, we're looking at, into it uh, act. And yes, there will be changes, for example. There will definitely be changes. Okay, thank you. Richard, any comment on that question? Yeah, I mean, so we're opening a bunch of hotels, new builds in the next actually year, year and a half. The, the easy answer would be, oh yeah, we're gonna make a whole bunch of changes. The truth of the, of the matter is most of the places were so far along, the changes would be not really structural, but you know, barricades and that kind of thing. But I, I'm not sure that we are gonna make a whole bunch of changes. I don't know what they would really be. 
um, we're opening a hotel by the convention center in Orlando, right next door to the convention center. So you go, oh my God, what are we going to do? Is the convention center not going to do any business anymore? Are we going to change everything? I, I don't think so. I think there's still going to be conventions. It may be a while, but I'm not sure what changes we would even make, honestly. And I'm not sure what room we have to make changes. You know, real estate's expensive. You've got a little piece of land, you, you know, how do you make that much changes? I'm not really sure. We'd certainly be open to suggestions, but I don't know what we would really do. The, the easy answer is, oh yeah, we're gonna make changes, but I'm not really sure what they would be. Okay, Keith? So, so our project at TiVo down to Miami is a perfect example of, of this scenario. Uh, it's a beautiful building. We're scheduled to break ground this summer. And we have actually spent many, many hours, including a call today at four o'clock with Architect Tonica and our interior designer, Urban Robot, thinking through what changes we'd actually make. Because we can still make them on a pencil and paper, it's a lot easier to plan that the building is already being built and finished. As Richard mentioned, it's harder to kind of adapt already existing building. So we are really staying hyper-focused on it. Um, we're gonna take the next 18 months of construction, see what other great builders do. Our building's somewhat dynamic because it actually has retail on the first floor. It has a 100,000 square feet of office condo. It has 140 hotel rooms and 460 apartments. So you can imagine it's a pretty big vertical building that's 570 feet up in the air. But we are really now thriving toward health and wellness. And we have 70,000 square feet of amenity space that we were programming. Oh, no. Sorry. And what we're doing with that space is we are really thinking about more outdoor space, uh, more space that smaller groups can work out, can be together in, uh, how to stay extra cleanliness in the spas and massage areas and hallways. And we really have a list of about 25 items that we're happy to share with anyone to help any building now. Uh, that we think are important that we're going to work on and we're really going to continue to learn and grow during this process so on the nativo front uh, we've really taken this beyond serious and trying to make our building be the best building knowing there's a, some of a new standard or new norm in the living also hotel business and also at nativo because we have home sharing which means that someone who buys a unit can rent it out themselves or rent it with our platform we think that people will start traveling to Miami and staying here longer. So in the old days of hopping on a flight for a night or two nights may lead to let's go for a week. So we've also looked at our unit mix, making sure that we have larger units that can accommodate more people and families. Um, so thankfully we are uh, in the process of building, we're able to adapt a little bit toward this. On the other hospitality front in our current hotels, as Richard mentioned, we're learning every single day. So we are really taking every chance we can to learn, put in new sanitizer things, work in the air conditioning, work in the filtration system, and as well as our bars. So bars like Bodega, or our new one in Fort Lauderdale, we're thinking about what is gonna be the new norm of people socializing? Because those places are typically uh, opposite of social distancing, they are all together. So we are really working every day on this. Uh, learning, reading, implementing, and trying. Because I believe that, as Richard said, no one really knows the answer, but we have to continue to try and move forward and hopefully that'll get us to the right position. Thank you. Uh, our Biz Now folks are gonna do some polling and we're gonna engage our audience. And our first polling question is, how many months do you think it will take for the hospitality industry to return to pre-COVID status? And Please uh, use your Zoom interface to respond to poll question number one, please. Okay, uh, next question I have again is from the audience. Uh, thanks so much for the participation. We're, we're getting several questions. And uh, again, I'm gonna take this to Carlos. Carlos, can you talk about how this crisis is impacting valuations of, of your assets, if at all? Yes, it has, and, 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 and it will continue for a period of time. Um, like I said, the ramp up, I think, in, in, you know, in, in my case, internally, we're projecting uh, or using uh, our projections, uh, getting back to 2019 numbers, 
sometime in two and a half years. Or so. That's what we're internally using for our own numbers. As a result of that, you know, we, uh, and as a result of the slow ramp up, we believe that the discounts, I mean, there is a gap between potential sellers right now and buyers. I mean, I'm seeing buyers, uh, potential buyers, looking at discounts in the 30 to 40% range and, and potential sellers in the 20% range. But uh, I would say to you that the truth is probably somewhere in the middle, uh, probably a discount in the 30%. Uh, 25 to 30 percent it'll probably be the discounts that you would have to apply if there was a transaction taking place now um, transactions per se I think there will be an avalanche of transactions actually I was participating in a webinar the other day where a gentleman that was uh, participating with me used the word a tsunami of transactions that's gonna be taking place and uh, I see that being anywhere between 6 to 12 months for now uh, with a window call it between six to 18 months of transactions, you know, right now there's not much in, in, you know, because first of all, capital markets are semi dislocated, let's call it. Um, so there's not much transaction that, and, and a lot of hotels will have to go through the process, go through the system, uh, go through the service or what, uh, right. I've only seen a few, made offers in a couple uh, as we speak, uh, but you know, there's not much happening at all. But things will start to transact, I would say six, eight months from now, and it will be a bundle. I think it will be a lot of deals happening. And uh, I do believe it'll be somewhere in the 30, 25, 30, 35% discount range is where I see it happening uh, down the road. But that's just my gut telling me from what I'm talking to people and what from our internal meetings and, and discussions and analysis uh, that I'm basing myself on. How about you, Richard? Uh, what are your comments on valuations? Well, you know, first of all, I, I, you know, whatever sales there are in the next 18 months, they're, they're not a bunch of willing sellers. There are a bunch of willing buyers, but not a lot of willing sellers, unless those that are forced to sell or all lenders selling, you know, their own. so that's an interesting dynamic. I'm not quite sure that anybody knows what a good deal is right now because we don't know what the operating results are going to be. I think it's, that's kind of an interesting part of it. I also think that the the our normal translation of what goes on. I happen to think that the first guys that open up their hotels uh, in tough markets are the losers, not the winners because they're going to lose a heck of a lot of money operating those things. So that's going to affect the valuation. I think the guys that, you know, hang around and keep close for a little while until business gets back, semi back to normal, it may look, they may look better and may have a better hotel. Um, so I'm not sure what happens. I, you know, there's a, there's this famous, a bunch of money on the sidelines, but those some people that are on the sidelines also have a bunch of uh, property already hotels. So I'm not sure what really happens. It's going to be an avalanche, but it all depends on what happens to the world and the, and the travel business. It's not just, in this case, it's not just about hotels. It's about every kind of real estate you can think of. I mean, look at the stories about the retail business. Look what they keep telling us about office buildings now. We're all going to shrink our space, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So who knows? I mean, I just, I have no clue. I think there's going to be deals out there. Obviously, the value of everything that we all have is, is, is dropped and the value of everything we want to buy is dropped. Um, I, you know, I, I don't know where it all lands. Part of where it lands is how quickly we kind of get up and open again. And also whether this um, virus comes back and gets us again when the weather gets cold. I, that, you know, the jury's out on all of that. Whether, you know, us getting started again right now is the end of it. We don't really even know that. So, you know, Carlos who's right, there's going to be a lot of stuff on the market with unwilling sellers and very willing buyers, what does that do? I mean, you know, the realism of life is the realism of life. If you gotta let it go, you gotta let it go. So we'll see what happens. I think, um, I think this will also have a huge impact on, the, on hotel development. That's another part of this. If you're gonna, if you haven't broken ground on something yet, I, I don't think there's a whole lot of lenders wanna add a bunch of supply right now. So that's a whole nother part of this as well. But yeah, 
And Carlos is right. There's, there's a bunch of deals to be done. They're going to be a lot less uh, than they were six months ago. We'll see what happens. I have no number to put to it. Keith, thoughts on valuations of uh, current assets or future valuations? Sure. So the ironic thing is that every industry, no matter what industry you're in, felt this vibration and felt this hit. So I think, yes, there'll be big opportunity, um, like there always is at times like this. Uh, really, even though I'm a hospitality entrepreneur by nature, I've really been focusing on stabilizing our existing business and focusing on our projects. I haven't really thought that much about buying other real estate now, um, but I think like everything, real estate's worth the cash flow. And if cash flow is down, some may say it's worth less, but I still believe there's still iconic, amazing assets that will still always be there and always hold. So I'm sure there'll be a lot of deals that hit the pipelines that Carlos mentioned next six months to a year. There'll be some opportunity. We'll for sure buy some things, maybe sell some things. Um, but I think, you know, right now, the hardest thing will be people financing deals, people valuing deals, trying to appraise on deals. Uh, all those things will really be tools that really create this called deal flow environment. So uh, I think, you know, we can all predict it, but uh, I think if you own good real estate, don't panic. It's always great real estate. It'll do well. I think we're trying to buy great real estate. Could be a great time to buy great real estate if you have a motivated seller. Uh, if you don't, then it's still the same day it was before coronavirus. And I think that if you're looking at new deals, it's still great. Start on pen and paper first, make sure it pencils out, much cheaper than brick and mortar. And I think those individuals will also find deals. So hopefully there'll be some great deal flow, some great movement that'll come out of this negative environment. Okay, thanks so much. Uh, great, great response. Uh, again, we're getting great audience questions and, and I have another one here. It seems like uh, a real narrative with these questions is about it. Um, uh, Carlos, maybe you could opine on that and talk a little bit about how you see lending for hotels or current lending environment, how that's been impacted by this uh, crisis. Well, uh, new loans right now are difficult to get if, if you're searching for a new loan. Um, you know, CMBS uh, for hotels is down. Uh, and, and also banks are, are pretty much, um, you know, closed at this moment in time for new loans. So if you're looking for a new loan currently, um, you know, there is, there is a, a availability. I mean, there is loans available, uh, but more for like bridge loans from, um, you know, funds and, and from basically from Wall Street. Uh, and there, you know, you're probably getting a loan, a new loan today, a percent loan to value in the eight to 9% range, you know, of interest. Today. So if you're looking for a new loan, it's expensive money at this moment in time uh, until things calm down, until things, until people, you know, basically the markets open up and people start settling in and understanding more the uh, the uh, the ramp up and and the recovery time period once the recovery time period and, and and the ramp up is understood and people feel more comfortable then you know the cmbs market i'm sure is going to come back and i'm sure it's going to be the regular banks are going to come back and you'll see new loans the interest rates and the terms improving substantially uh, but currently you're basically down to Wall Street and, and investment funds and their cost of capital is higher. That's for new phones, loans. For existing loans, I mean, uh, if you need to negotiate some sort of forbearance, you're gonna have a lot more luck and you'll be in a much better position to negotiate with banks when the loans have been done from their own balance sheet. Uh, if you have a CMBS loan, it's a little bit more difficult uh, because there you need to deal with a master servicer. It needs to get transferred to the special servicer. And then even the special servicer, you know, basically has a, uh, an ownership group that owns the class B uh, interest, you know, the, the, you know that, that basically calls the shots. So there, you know, the flexibility to renegotiate a loan on the CMBS side, it's, it's, it's very, very difficult. Um, we have great relationships with, with pretty much all the special servicers. We work with them because we also manage hotels on their behalf. 
from the sister management company for Riverwood Hospitality Management. We, we handle a lot of distress hotels and fixing hotels on, on their behalf. So we have a very close relationship with them and, and we work with them closely in trying to help out um, hotel owners manage the process. But, but it's a complicated process, it takes time, and they don't have as much flexibility as the regular banks. Um, now, this will, again, this too shall pass. So in a few months, I think that the markets will back, start opening up again and you'll see better terms as time progresses and as time, as people understand more, you know, the ramp up, understand more, you know, uh, or, or feel more comfortable lending money because they feel, as Keith was mentioning, it's all about the cash flow. As long as they understand that there's going to be cash flow to pay them back their loan, you know, you'll start seeing uh, the markets start opening up. But there is loans. Just, just to, you know, I know for a fact that, you know, Wall Street is open for business and there's a lot of funds available, uh, including ourselves, available making loans at this time. But the cost of capital is a lot higher. The terms are a little bit tougher. Richard? So first of all, Carlos is the expert, so he did a great job. So I, I, I can't even come close to his experience and expertise. Um, so, and you know, we haven't been out there trying to look for loans for projects over the last five, six weeks. So I don't know, I can say two things. One is I must get 20 emails a day from lenders I've never heard of telling me they got money, whatever that means. I don't, I haven't pursued it. That's one. And two is, if you've done this for very long, hotels have never been the preferred real estate vehicle for a lot of lenders. So it's always been a difficult thing to uh, finance hotels, particularly uh, from new development standpoint. And I think based on what's going on, we may in the long term do better than the tra traditional um, real estate loans. You know, we were like not the favorite guy, but retails definitely got issues. Um, office definitely has issues. So it may, in the long term, improve our chances of being preferred borrowers. But in the meantime, obviously, you know, it's just the next 18 months. Who knows? Let's see what happens. But I think Carlos said it all. Uh, CMBS has always been difficult because you never know who's really in charge. So, but, uh, you know, I think, you know, most all of us are going to ask for forbearances. Um, I'm sure it's going to start off by the lenders being very tough. And when the real world, you know, we really understand the real world, they're going to give it to most of us, but not for long. And, you know, I think you can get a forbearance for 90 or 120 days. That's going to be about it. So we'll see what happens after that. So, yeah, I think Carlos did a good job. Keith, any comments on the uh, lender environment? Sure. Uh, I think Carlos said it very, very well. In fact, we shall record that. We should play it back or ask this question. Uh, it's, it's been a challenging environment. I think, um, you know, a lot of people are reading the papers today that so-and-so is closing our loan and so-and-so got financed, but don't kid yourself. A lot of those loans were already in the works before and already approved before this happened. And they're either closed now or they closed before and they're announcing now. So we do see some positivity in the media, but I don't know if that's actually really happening in today's environment. I will tell you that uh, I'm a partner in a large hotel. Uh, and we were actually going out for refinancing about a month before Corona hit us. We were dealing with 40 different lenders. We were investing mortgage broker teams on the deal. And even then it was somewhat difficult, but we thought we'd get it done. And unfortunately we actually didn't get it done. Uh, so we actually fell into this environment where we were trying to refinance, it didn't happen. And as everybody thinks, call your lender, ask for forbearance, they'll say yes. Not every lender says that. So our lender basically said, you have a loan, we have a position, do as you wish. So, uh, you know, it's, it's not easy because you have a loan that's literally paid by your tenant or by your cash flow. And hopefully there's something in the middle of that that you get to keep as profit. So this has been a very, very challenging time for ourselves in that particular deal. And, and there's also many more deals out there. So uh, now's the time to, as Carlos mentioned, try to get your pro formas done, try to reach out to lenders. They will open and lend again. Uh, Carlos said it right, where I think their rates will be higher. You know, I think you're going to say to them, I was used to paying X, and now it's X plus 30%, 20%. And that will maybe the new norm for now. So um, it is a very tough environment. Whoever says it's not is crazy. But we all have to really 
try to use each other's resources and try to really just think things through. And again, I think the financing world is tough for all industries. Hotels have always been hard to finance, but look at retail, uh, look at restaurants, look at residential, look at new ground up condos. So I think it's gonna be a very challenging environment, but we know what lenders like historically. So you have to still check that box and do more. So for example, we're lucky that in Ativo, we are well over 60% sold and we're selling units every single day. So we know that we're at a level where lenders we're always comfortable with, if not more, so we feel good. But if we were at a level of 20% sales today, uh, it'd be a different story. So luckily on that project, we were actually in a phenomenal position and we're selling units like crazy. Uh, but on the hotel front, I do have one asset now that I have to refund. So, you know, you have to kind of take it all slowly, speak to intelligent people, um, really learn as much as you can and try to do our best. And thanks so much. Yeah, thanks for the feedback there. Great answers. Uh, we do have some results of our polling in. And the first polling question was, how many months do you think it will take for the hospitality industry to return to pre-COVID status? Uh, and overwhelming results, 68% of our respondents said more than 12 months. 23% uh, were 12 months and uh, six months or less was 8%. So thanks so much for, for polling in our audience and we're gonna ask another question shortly. Um, let's talk about geography a little bit in Florida as a tourist destination more so than business travel or convention travel, although Orlando has quite a bit of that. Do you see what's happening in the state of Florida with Governor DeSantis really pushing to open up and, and get back to normal. Do you see Florida performing any better or any differently because of uh, the dynamics of our state, uh, different from other states in the country or regions in the country? Uh, what do you think about that, Carlos? Well, by far, the leisure market is going to be the first one to improve, uh, is going to improve faster than any other market, uh, than the uh, corporate transient or the group business. So the leisure market for sure um, is gonna be the first one and is gonna be the one that is gonna ramp up a lot quicker. And Florida in general uh, tends to focus a lot on the leisure market. Obviously there's group business and there's business, you know, transient business, but, but the leisure market, especially in the beaches, uh, is very strong. So, um, you know, just to give you uh, an idea, right now, we have hotels. I have a hotel in, uh, in uh, St. Augustine. I have a hotel in Daytona. We have a hotel in Cocoa Beach. We have a hotel in Melbourne. And uh, we also have hotels in Orlando and here in Miami. Well, I can tell you all the beach hotels uh, and the areas that have opened up uh, partially uh, are doing a hell of a lot better than our hotels here in Miami or that are more business oriented, that are more oriented towards the group business or to the travel business, uh, to the tra corporate transient. So extend the stay hotels um, and, and, and the uh, leisure group, you know, leisure travel destinations are gonna be the ones feeling the impact, the improvement faster. We're seeing it. Like, uh, you know, the little uh, Hampton that we have in Daytona Beach, uh, every weekend, the last couple of weekends has been full. And uh, Cocoa Beach, the Hilton that we have there, is starting to have a lot larger uh, occupancies. We own, a, we have a Margaritaville in Lake of the Ozarks, not here in Florida, but again, for the summer, I'm seeing large reservations already. Despite of the fears and everything, I'm seeing a lot of reservations. So, Anything to do with leisure is gonna improve uh, first. And then after that is gonna be group transient, I mean, a corporate transient. And then after that, the last one to improve will be groups in my mind. And I think that that's uh, something that everybody else shares. So as a result, I would say Florida should, should do okay uh, as far as ramp up with the hotels uh, because there's a, lot of, there's a huge leisure component to a lot of our hotels here in Florida. Thank, thank you. Uh, Richard, uh, comments on Florida? And you have some international hotel properties also from, from my previous introduction. Uh, 
maybe a little bit of information about that could be helpful too. Sure. Well, first of all, I, I, Florida is not uh, one market. There's a ton of different markets in Florida. You know, Miami, we're the gateway to, to uh, Latin America and also to Europe. And uh, obviously those tourists, uh, particularly from Europe, uh, may not be coming here this summer or in the next few months at all because they can't. So that market's probably gone away. Much of stuff in Latin America can't come here. We, we have a couple of hotels in Mexico and are building one. Uh, the hotel that we're building, as opposed to the United States, on uh, May, no, April 1st, they, there was no more construction in Mexico. They, they shut it down. And we can't start building the hotel again until the middle of June. But that changes the dynamics of lots of things about people coming, coming here from Mexico, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, because they haven't been working and they don't have money, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So Florida is a different thing. The places where Carlos has hotels are exactly all drive markets from really the Southeast more than anything. And we think those will do well. It's like they told us that Las Vegas will do very well because it's a drive market from Los Angeles and there's a pent up demand. So I think Carlos is right about some parts of Florida, but not all parts of Florida. I think we're gonna struggle in Miami Beach. I also think because the cruise industry is completely shut down, there's pluses and minuses with that. Those people have got to go somewhere, but a lot of them came to Miami and then got on a cruise ship. They're not doing that anymore. So I think the jury's a little bit out, particularly in Miami Beach, Key Biscayne and the, and the Keys. The Keys will get some drive market from Miami, but I, yeah, I think the jury's out. I think the governor's done a great job in the state of Florida, but we got a long way to go to see what happens and remember, we are the gateway to South America, Europe, and the islands, and those people aren't going to come here for a while, and we're not going there either, so we'll see what happens. I think we'll recover more quickly. That's one part of it. Yeah, the other part of it is, yeah, we have hotels all over the place. Mexico, Brazil, Dominican Republic, Jamaica, Puerto, yeah, all over the place down there. Every country is a different story. We have a Marriott, big Marriott courtyard in Aruba. They shut down Aruba two months ago and it's still shut down. And we don't really know what's gonna happen there. The Billy Hotel in Curacao, the same thing. Every country's got a different story. One of the issues with this whole coronavirus thing is not just every country in the, in the, you know, in the United States, every state's you know, running by different rules, opening up in different ways and so forth and so on. It's not really a united effort, so nobody really knows. Um, but I, but we, we think Florida will certainly open up quicker than we think New York will. We just think, New York is going to be a disaster because there were so many cases there. People are spooked to go there completely. Uh, so many people have died there. So we think Florida will, will do better based on what the government has done. But the jury is out as to how well we're going to do and where. I think Orlando will come back quicker than Miami, but that's just a guess. I, you know, <laughs> we have been asked so many prognostications that none of us really know, but we'll see what happens. But it's certainly um, from a resort standpoint, north of Miami, we think we'll start to ramp up better. Thanks so much, Richard. Keith, uh, what, what are your thoughts on uh, the regional impact we may have here in South Florida and Florida compared to other parts of the country? Yeah, um, these guys really said it pretty well. Uh, I think luckily most of our businesses in South Florida, other than Chicago and a little bit inside New York City. Um, but you know, I think the Florida government's been doing great governor. I think that our local city municipality, Miami Beach, which is the mayor, keeping us updated and the city commissions and everyone's really been doing their best to keep us updated. And hopefully this thing comes back in a good way. So I'm very positive about it. And I hope that, you know, again, there'll be a 2.0 way of traveling. There'll be a 2.0 way of people living in, in, in this environment. We just have to be cognizant to it. And hopefully it comes back strong. But I think that our government, our city is doing the best they can do to kind of guide us and lead us in these crazy times. All right, thanks, uh, Joe, I see you jump back on. Yeah, Jeff, thank you so much for leading the discussion. What a fantastic job. And Richard, Carlos, Keith, I really appreciate all of you taking the time out of your day to join us. Um, and with that being said, we're gonna conclude today's webinar. Make sure you all join us next week as we're gonna be doing a South Florida update featuring Blanca and Crocker Partners. Once again, thank you all for joining and look forward to seeing you next week. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Carlos. Thank you. Appreciate it.